We're going to begin our exploration of conservation biology with some basics. Before we can get into the details of what conservation entails, we need a clear understanding of what exactly biodiversity is. What is the target? We know that biodiversity refers to the variety of life on the planet, but that concept is far too broad to be of much practical value. It's like getting up in the morning and saying you're off to achieve world peace. What does that even mean? What we need to do is break down the concept of biodiversity into components that we can build management objectives around. This first video will provide an introduction to these components. Think of it as a rough first cut. We'll keep on refining these ideas as we proceed, and then by the end of the video series, everything should be crystal clear, I hope. There are three main components to biodiversity. Species, of course, entire ecosystems, and genetics. We'll look at each of these in turn. We'll begin with species. What tends to get most attention are cute fuzzy mammals and other vertebrates. But it's actually insects and plants and fungi and crustaceans and such that make up the vast majority of species. Vertebrates, which get most attention and most conservation resources, they only account for roughly 3% of all species. Question, is it right to prioritize some species over others? Or should we be treating them essentially equally? And who gets to decide these kind of things anyway? These are important questions and they get to the heart of what conservation is all about. We'll consider them in a lot more detail in upcoming lectures. Moving on now to measuring biodiversity, the most basic measure is referred to as species richness, which is simply the count of the number of different species in a given area. And if you're in the Amazon, you have a lot of counting to do. There are upwards of 16,000 tree species alone in the Amazon. Compare that with Canada, we have less than 200 tree species across the entire country. The point is, the level of species richness varies greatly from one region to another. Species richness can be refined by taking spatial scale into consideration. To understand this, let's take a hike up a mountainside. At the base, richness is high, and then as you gain elevation, the mix of species will change and the total number of species will begin to decline. In this stylized diagram of our mountain hike, the circles represent spots where we stop to measure the species present. The individual species are represented here as letters. Now as we go upwards, we see that the uh, number of species in every site, it declines and the mixture of species changes from one study site to the next. The diversity that's present within any given study site is referred to as alpha diversity, whereas the change in uh, variability in diversity from one site to the next is referred to as beta diversity and a diversity across the entire region, uh, the mountainside in this case, is referred to as gamma diversity. And of course, gamma diversity is comprised of both uh, alpha and beta diversity together. Of course, in applied conservation, we need to know a lot more about species than simply the number present. Are they native or are they introduced? Are any at risk of extinction? What's their natural history and their ecological role and so forth? We'll have a closer look at all of these attributes when we get to the lectures on species level conservation. Moving on now to genetic diversity, I'm going to use aspen as an example. Aspen trees grow throughout Canada and much of the United States, and one aspen tree looks pretty much like every other aspen tree. But genetically, they're quite distinct. How do we know this? Well, scientists have taken seedlings from Minnesota and transplanted them to northern parts of the prairie provinces. Turns out that the Minnesota trees, well, they're more productive, they grow faster. But the local trees, they have better tolerance to early frost. So the take-home message is that animals and plants, even if they look identical, they have genetic adaptations that are tailored to local conditions. And those adaptations are important to maintain as part of our conservation efforts. Genetic variability within populations is also of concern to conservationists, especially when working with endangered species. This is a picture of a swift fox that was raised in a captive rearing facility in preparation for release back onto the Canadian prairies where they had been extirpated. When working with small populations like this, it's important to avoid inbreeding and the loss of genetic variants amongst individuals. Otherwise, this can lead to a loss of fitness. Turning finally to ecosystem diversity, we're faced with the challenge of defining what exactly it is that we're trying to measure. Think back to our virtual hike up the mountainside. We, get, we began at the bottom in one type of ecosystem, but then ended up in something completely different at the top. Yet nowhere along the trail was there a line demarcating the transition from one to the other. The reality is that many ecosystems transition imperceptibly from one to the next. We also need to grapple with spatial scale. 
In this picture, you could say we're dealing with a wetland ecosystem adjacent to a grassland ecosystem. However, at a different spatial scale, you might say we're dealing with a prairie pothole ecosystem comprised of a mixture of wetlands and grasslands. In practice, we define ecosystems on the basis of features that are important to us. For example, a forestry company might classify its landscape on the basis of forest stand type, whereas a fisheries manager might use watersheds defined at multiple scales. For terrestrial conservation planning, the most important system of ecological classification is the National Ecological Framework. What we're seeing here is the coarsest level of classification referred to as ecozones. Nested within the ecozones are ecoregions and ecodistricts. Individual zones are defined on the basis of landforms, major soil types, climate, and so forth, together with the characteristic vegetation associated with those features. Ecosystem diversity can also be described in terms of the variability and complexity within individual ecosystems. This has both a vertical dimension, as shown in the tree on the left, and a horizontal dimension, as shown in the patterns on the right. The three metrics that we use to describe this diversity are composition, that is, what are the species present in a given area, structure, how are those species arranged in three-dimensional space, and function, what are the characteristic processes of this ecosystem. Well, that's it for our introduction to biodiversity, but we'll be revisiting all of these topics in more of an applied context when we get to the chapters on species and ecosystem conservation, so stay tuned.